us all better to stay here county. Um, I think the sort of immediate thing that people say uh, is that it's not motherhood. And that's not wrong. It's, um, it's just also not entirely complete. I feel like that's an oversimplification of so many of the ideas and experiences that I'm thinking about when I make this work. Um, and so I just want to talk about that uh, sort of first <laughs> and think about um, think about how motherhood for me means a lot of things beyond just uh, a birthday person as a child and my own right? Um, when I was thinking about motherhood, I was thinking about my own personal experience. Um, but I was also thinking about the way the community happens. And when I became a mother in grad school, I was uh, working part time. I uh, was still deeply involved in a lot of legislative work, um, community based activism, and advocacy work. And it's when I actually started being tired of this. Good. 
while I was like processing all of this and deciding what would happen next, that so feeling of community coming together even when I haven't asked for it, or when I had asked for it, but I hadn't expected it. Um, it was similar to sort of the small community that I had when I had already, which actually is small, but mine's actually big. I had a high school cohort who often Or, you know, some of my teachers who live very far in the class would be distracted on my body. Or, my students who did not know that I taught the part of distracted on my body. I think about the Melody Collective, who were at the time kind of the only sort of recent mothers that I knew. Motherhood and baby 
neighbor, care, community. I wanted to imagine this space the home. Um, the home has featured as a part of our for a long time. And, um, you know, homes are technically the United States, but in a lot of our work, I use the elements of the home in public spaces because, one, in my experience, the home has been one that's like very shared. Thank <laughs> you. 
here's, um, you know, she's gentle and she's calm and now we're gentle parenting, so we're keeping cool and we're like gracious with our kids and like, I think a lot about how realistic that is for so many reasons. Obviously, I think we do a better job talking about the complicated nature of parenting and that we fail all the time as parents. Um, which, you think about, so I think that for the community, we feel a lot more in our community and serve community too, right? But how we succeed as parents or in the community is by recognizing that we're failing and continuing to grow from that failure. But the other part of it, the sexual part of it, I'm like, a pregnant person is the most sexual being you can look at. There is no proof that she has sex on her body right now. Which is maybe a little too frank, but I'm like, how can we say that mothers are these pristine things when they're just like these sexual beasts and they're about to like give birth to another little beast? Right? I mean, I used to get in on when I was pregnant more than me.
being pregnant and having people listen to you or not. And the safety that we receive and the care that we receive in the world around us when we're doing that. And so, you know, I like this piece because she could be the child. She could be the mother. She could be the daughter or the sister. Um, and then again, like so many of these bodies hold a lot of different roles and a lot of different realities. So, uh, so and then we have, again, we're kind of moving through the house, right? Um, um, so this is the garden, actually. So we've entered, we've gone into the garden. We so we to take some fruit. Uh, you know, this garden piece um, looks almost exactly like I picture it when I sketched it. And that doesn't really happen with artwork, so I'm making them. Um, but um, one of the things you'll notice is that flowers and the um, like elements of flowers and gardens kind of appear in a lot of the works. Some ways, like little flowers on the bellies uh, and all the fiber designs, there's little flowers, um, roses, you know, actual gardens. And I, um, part of this was like, again, I was returning to this idea of community. Um, I spent time between Georgia and Florida. And in Florida, I live, when I'm there, I live in a very rural community. Um, and then in Atlanta, I live in the city. And in both places, community gardens actually are super important parts of those communities. So, um, and I like that. I like that community gardens matter no matter where you live um, or what the reality of the world around you is. Like super urban environments, you have to have a community garden if you want to grow stuff. It means you have other people are coming together, they're making it, they're making it happen, they're caring for something together, they're building something up together. I love community gardens, I think they're just like the coolest thing. It's like the most beautiful, like, I mean, I know there's a lot of drama. Also, if you've ever been in a community garden, you know there's a lot of drama. Great. Right? Like, just like anything in our world, we're humans, and so there's like power struggles and like ideas about how to do things right. Um, you know, this pressure not to fail that makes us like express a lot more ego than maybe we should. And um, and I just really wanted to have a garden here because like I think it's a beautiful picture of a community, but also a space where failure happens and growth happens. So. Uh, I mean, I can talk more. Um, I say garden, obviously there's fruit offerings here for you now. Um, in other versions of this installation, there would be like plants here where you could cut and take, or water, you could feed it, you take cuttings. And I like this version where you can take fruit and you can eat it. But I like the other version too, um, that give and take was something that was really interesting to me. So, um, so yes, the garden. We're going to go into the dining room now. especially for people. I love baking. Um, my husband is a chef. Well, he was a chef. Now he just cooks for me at home. And um, I think most of us recognize that preparing food for others and giving food to others is like an act of care that is very powerful. Uh, and I didn't used to cook, and then I learned to bake, and I'm like, oh my god, I want to bake everybody. Like, cheesecake. I love baking. Or pies, you know? So, Obviously, I can't sit here and bake for you guys, but I can offer fruit up, and you can sit at the table, and you can make a mess, and I mean, you could throw strawberries at each other. I'm fine with that. Um, so the table is here. We have windows. We have a chair. We have a rug. We have spaces where you can sit and rest. 
where tired bodies are sitting and resting. And that's all very important to me because I think, um, again, we're constantly working, we're constantly making. Uh, as mothers, we need spaces to, to ourselves, but we also need spaces that we can share with each other, be near each other, and, uh, you know, give and take, give and take, and reciprocity, and all of that. So, watching hard bodies be birthed, and I want to talk about how, um, with motherhood or parenthood, one of the ideas that was interesting to me, because I've been studying for some time with the gift economy, right? That was a big part of the endeavor research, and it continues to like inform a lot about how I think about the world. And, um, and our relationships with each other are full of give and take, right? Uh, you know, it's like humans in the world, right? Um, every relationship has some give and some take, and certain relationships have power that transform how that give and take looks, right? You, the give and take you have with your boss at work is different than the give and take you have with your best friend you've known your whole life, which is still even different from the give and take of a friend you've known for a year, right? And then, of course, we have like the really complicated and, and toxic, toxic relationship of our culture, which then compounds the problems of power imbalance and give and take in relationships to an even greater degree. And so things like a movement in the community to do good are sometimes overshadowed by a need for power, or a struggle with ego, or a desire to perform in a certain way, or execute, or produce a certain result, or, you know, there's just things that end up happening. And so I think about that a lot too, and then that all makes me think about the lack of reciprocity in parental relationships. So as a mother or a parent, I know that my daughter, who's probably in the other room just reading or playing with iPad, <laughs> can never give back to me the things I have given her, and that is okay. And I can never give back to my mother all the things she has given me. Now, parental relationships are often rife with various kinds of trauma. Some, I mean, the rant and the, you know, um, the scale of violence in the world. That could be mundane violence or, you know, very traumatic violence, right? Be anything. You know? Everyday violence is another idea that's really interesting to me, so we all perform violence in our lives at some point or another. It's a part of life. You can say that, and you're okay with it. But obviously, there's the scale, there's a spectrum of violence where some things become worse, right? And then that, that reciprocal or non-reciprocal relationship of parent to child is, is skewed, right? So that's different. But I'm talking about like a relationship where things are mostly fine, you know? I might like yell at my mom when I'm a teenager, Fine. But like mostly fine. I'm still never going to be able to give to her all the things she's given to me. I hope I give them to my daughter, and I hope I'm able to give her more because there are things my daughter, my mom, couldn't give to me because of her history. And um, I've been thinking about that a lot because you know we talk about give and take, but it's actually not a real reality for all of our relationships, and especially in family relationships, it's particularly unreal. There is no truly reciprocal relationship in a family. Now that changes as we age, right? Um, I now help care for my mother. Not the same way that I care for my daughter, but she also helps care for my daughter. And so we have this intergenerational care situation that teaches me a lot about the things I can and can't do, the things I can, and not, can give and can't give, the places I fail, <laughs> and the places where I'm actually succeeding. And I think a lot about how, if we understood that some relationships are never reciprocal, that might better inform how we engage with others outside of home. Right? We're in community, 
And we know that as an advocate, we can spend all of our time burning ourselves out serving others. There's going to be a point that's not returned to us. And that's, that's, that's part of the work. And so understanding that it's not returned to us in the same way that we're giving actually will save us and probably save community movements in a way that I think we're still, we're still kind of learning and talking about. Um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm being clear. This idea is like the hardest for me to get at because it like talks about a couple of different things. Like I've experienced burnout and worked with domestic violence survivors for a long time and gave a lot of myself and felt very good about that. And then transitioned from that to like different community work around sexual trauma, which also felt good, but also felt like I spent years giving and not receiving. And that was okay, but it, it was different. I don't know, there was something different about that giving. And because I had experienced this this other relationship with this kind of activism and advocacy <coughs> work, I was surprised by it. And I let myself get to this place where I became like kind of bitter and like kind of kind of messed up about it. And I was like, I gotta stop. <laughs> I gotta step back, because this isn't right. This isn't how I'm supposed to treat this work or treat myself or treat others. And so I did. And I became a mother. <laughs> and then I'm like learning about this this non-reciprocal relationship where I'm like giving a lot and like <laughs> I am, I feel a lot, and uh, I'm lucky to have a partner and, like I said, a family where we give each other space to, like, okay, you need to go, like, have your day. <laughs> go have your day. And it's great. It's beautiful. Because um, not everybody gets that, and I'm very privileged to have that. And it has taught me a lot about how I can treat the work I do in community better, and how I can treat others better in community as well. Hopefully I kind of circled that up pretty well. That's where I was trying to get. <laughs> so anyways, um, these pieces are all a little different. Um, I'm going to try to get a little wrapped up so you guys can ask questions, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions about each piece and materials and anything else you want to ask about. I'm very open, as you can tell. Um, the window pieces do marry sort of births of the entire bodies in the show, so that's the closest I got to that sort of like nested birthing performance that I was going to do. Instead, they're in the photographs, and I kind of love and it's my little brother and my little sister performing with me, so I think that's kind of lovely. Um, there's some books here that informed my research for this show. There's also books on the small table out in the lobby area in front of the catalogs that also informed my work. And then the only thing I want to mention before I like, open up the floor to questions is this piece, the rug piece, where you can come stand or sit or lie, Take a nap, I'm taking naps here. <laughs> and um, and the photocopies and the drawings. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about that because we're in the corner too, because I was kind of forgetting about it. Um, so, this piece deals specifically with the maternal mortality rate as well. Um, the photocopies numbered 1,205, I think, it's on the label. <laughs> which is the 2021 maternal mortality rate in the U.S. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with my work in the past, I have often based performances and things off of statistics. I'm very intrigued by statistics as both a really good indicator of a problem, but also be hard, often hard to understand thing because numbers are easy to kind of say, oh, yeah, that's terrible. But we don't really understand what numbers look like. So I often like to visualize numbers. So there were that many copies, and some of those have been thrown away, and some of them have been drawn on and pinned up, and some of them have been taken home. And you have the options to do what you will with them. But I think I just wanted people to kind of sit here, rest, um, but also think about <laughs> the, um, you know, the reality of, the, you know, the, the the reality, right? So, it's maybe, I wouldn't say it's like the darkest piece, but, you know, my work in the past has often been heavier, and so this one has a little bit of that weight. Uh, the final piece that I'll talk about before I open the floor up is this small piece in the corner. 
um, which is also sort of the other weightier piece. Um, it was the last piece I developed in the show. It is right for failure um, because it has photographs of me burning for me to be never once I was done showing her. Um, so that was me sort of saying by her and then sort of saying, I think I'm going to like it. And also, here's my choice to let like, it go so, to, you know, I've shown her in a couple of other places.
do, but I don't feel like it can be bad as kind of common. And um, I think that comes from her very short lifetime of like being exposed to stuff constantly, which is like part of and like you know, I have been in spaces where they're not so well being of me bringing her, and those are not nice spaces. So what you learn? Yes, um, so the fire bodies don't have faces. Some of them have like, a space of the layer of that kind of looks like a head, depending on how they're shaped. But more and more, that space has been disappearing from just like breast and belly and legs and arms. Um, uh, that is like kind of like, similar to like the color choices. I'm trying to really hard to give these fire bodies an identity um, that is like specific to experiences. Also, not giving them too much of a specific identity, but it shuts them out immediately. It is less so for these than probably any other type of body of the but most of them are so abstract that you might be like, what's going to be a, could be like a not end body? Could be, you know? Uh, and I like that in the beginning. I, I think that these feel. Is it something? 
think that's soft? Is it both? Is it public space versus the space where we know we're being observed? Um, is it unintentionally just having so much fun and not paying attention to what we're doing? I think a lot about that with my kiddos, like my parents bodies all the time and I'm like tearing apart the <laughs> You know? Or like But I know fan art is just the only <laughs> usually for our culture and for Chinese, but red is like a warning color. Mm -hmm. And also red and gravity sometimes look like blood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know uh, I, I, I saw that uh, you know the so why you choose red and why what I don't know, yeah. there's no reason. But yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Is there any reason? You combine the pink and the red. Yes, the pinks, the reds, the purples, the like mommy, pink color. Um, a couple of things, and yes, the body, right? Well, technically not the red, but most of it is less, right? And our intestines and everything, you get bruised, you like purple green color, and like, you like cut yourself and the scabs. This one is called A Come Honoring Your Power, and her Greek name is Clytemestra. Love it. It's the Adam Mom's life, right? You know the story. All right, questions? I just love what you've done with the whole environment here, and I was just curious, like, what, it feels different to me than all the other pieces. I can talk about the process of this one, for sure, um, which might help with the answer, yeah? Okay, so the first part of this piece that you should know is that originally, in my mind, I was going to make an oversized rocking chair, like a giant rocking chair. I was like, yeah, I will both learn how to fabricate the regular rocking chair, and I'll make like a giant one. And I was like, yeah, I'm totally gonna happen. No. That was way too much. Um, learn your limits. So when I was collecting all this gifted furniture, um, I received, inadvertently, nine beautiful antique chairs. And at the time, I'd already known that each of the tarred bodies would have a different fiber arts technique as their breasts and bellies. This was partly like a craft decision or historical like situationing of the figures and that canon, but also like some of the choices specifically to illustrate gardens or birthing or the labor of weaving, but this particular quilt pattern is called a house pattern. Um, and I did not quilt this, one of my studio assistants did. Um, with, you know, I got it, he was like, Let me, what colors do I use? And I was like, here's all your fabric. It's like, okay, help me pin the order. And I was like, okay. <laughs> And I've never made clothes, but let's do it. So, but he did all the heavy lifting. And so I already had this tired body. I knew I was going to have clothes. And I had kind of figured out where I was going to place them as I was going with each piece. Um, so a few months later, I got all the chairs. I was like, well, I'm clearly not going to do a, um, a uh, rocking chair. That's not happening. I'd like to have a chair. I was like, OK, I have nine chairs. There's nine mothers. Maybe I'll have some kind of configuration of chairs like have chairs around the table, but I want the table to be low to the ground. Uh, maybe we'll have chairs along the wall and little like shelf pieces next to them. Mm, not quite feeling it. 
And I was like, hey, what if I quilted a chair? <laughs> and I was like, all right, I can do that. I can quilt a chair. I can put together nine chairs into a, quilt, a quilted chair. And that's what I did. And I'm not a woodworker, so if you look closely at this, you will see many things that probably a woodworker would not have done. But that's okay. It works. It moves. You can actually sit on it very carefully, especially like this middle one. You can stand on that middle part. And I really loved the way it looked. And then it was a matter of like, how does the figure interact with the piece? Um, I had come to decide already that the chair was actually going to be the Clytemnestra piece because there's something about the eye to honoring your power that feels like a throne. Um, Clytemnestra was a queen who was very powerful and in many ways wronged, but also kind of a badass. So. Uh, and I think I wanted, I was like, okay, so are we sitting on the chair? Are we like collapsed on the chair? Are we sleeping on the chair? It doesn't really matter, honestly. She is just interacting with the chair. And then it's about building out the space. So a lot of these other little elements are aesthetic choices, right? I really like engaging the wall as much as I can, even in a sculptural piece. I like texture. I found a piece of this fabric at a thrift store. So this, I will confess, is the one thing I purchased because there was not enough for a wall piece. So I did purchase some yardage of that because you can find it online, actually. I was like, OK, we're doing that. And um, because I was testing my skills a lot, I had wired lights already. And I was like, I want to wire another light because I'm really proud of my ability to do this now. Okay, mm -hmm. it's really easy, but it's super fun. And I already had two lights in the show. And another thing for me is numbers. Like, there's nine mothers, there's three of this, there's three of that. So there's got to be three lights. There can't be two. A little bit about building out of space, right? Making it feel like, I mean, this kind of feels like a living room. Like you could walk into it and like get cozy and read a book. But it's also just the space where you honor this particular tired body and make sure she has a place and a space to take up. That's the other reason about the walls. It's like, they should take up space. It shouldn't just be this little thing. I don't know if that Yeah, no, it just felt very different to me than any of the other pieces. And it was the one that I always went back to. And I noticed it didn't seem like he'd said anything specific about it. Um, I, I love this chair. I, like, I'm very proud of it. Like, I was like, okay, I drew it out, and I, was, like, and I took apart all the chairs, and I was like, oh god, I hope this works, because otherwise I'm like really not. Um, so I've got like, pictures of each stage of me trying to figure out how to put them back together. Um, I'll also be here for a while after the talk, so if you're like shy and you want to come talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I don't have to have the microphone while we talk. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes. Um, so I'm really intrigued by the aesthetic choices that you've made. Um, I love that you have this like vintage feel of you know thrifted things, and then that with the juxtaposition of these really crisp images um, showing showcasing technology and then also this like did you see those were photocopies yeah right so like then you have the like sort of vintage technology there so i just kind of want to hear your thoughts about like those choices and why mm. um i will say that as an artist i've never felt the need to limit myself by material <laughs> if you can't tell <laughs> um i often think terms of the whole show. So like while each of these pieces are their own individual piece, um, I was certainly imagining how they would all work together constantly. And that's how every show, it's, it's possibly like a, to my detriment as an artist, because it's sometimes hard for me to like imagine the whole story with just one piece, which would make my life easier production-wise. But you know, there's no point that I'm thinking about the arches and not also thinking about the chair and thinking about the bookshelf slash, you know, table and the bed. You know, like, it's all happening. And I'm like, okay. To me, the materials relate to each other because they tell different parts of the story. It doesn't have to be all soft sculpture. It doesn't have to be all woodwork or ceramics, you know. These are pieces of a full narrative of a story that's told by moving through all of the materials and all of the words. 
Um, I like the crispness of these digital images because it feels like a window to me. I was like, I want windows in here, you know? But I'm not gonna like put, it seems like hokey to put like glass, you know? Like I was like, I could like get window frames easily thrifted, right? I could find that stuff like everywhere. You find it on the side of the road. As much of the structure was gifted to me. But like this, I'm like, the whole idea of a window is to like look out into the world and see like beyond your immediate experience, right? So here we're looking out into this experience of labor and birth. I love it. And it doesn't feel like at odds with the rest of the story. Maybe because I use so many different materials, nothing's that jarring, you know? Maybe that works in my favor, but I just don't, it doesn't, I just don't really even think of it. It's just like more like what can the materials do for the story? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like the photocopies were actually, I can thank Mocha for that. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, I'm gonna do, th I'm gonna do a thousand drawings. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna do a thousand drawings in a year and all this other stuff too. I'm like, no. <laughs> they're like 300, it was great. Uh, and they're like, why did you make photocopies? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And then my main holdup was that I know other artists who work on photocopies and I was like, I don't, I feel like I would be like, biting your style or whatever, however the phrase goes. I shouldn't say stuff like that, but. <laughs> Um, but then I like, actually talked to one of the artists I know, and it's just like, this has nothing to do with my work. And I was like, okay, cool. So then I made photographs. And I kind of love it because it feels like, um, you know, I, as a mother, I have a lot of coloring books in my house. And like, obviously, they don't have color, but they're just like these thin, papered, like, highly produced things, right? That people can just like scribble on and they don't care about and throw them away and get coloring pages on them camp or school or whatever and they just like don't want to count some of them. <laughs> uh, and so I like that. It's like there's a, a high, like, the lowness of it works. Especially if you think about how we lack value in our medical care system for the experience of mothers. And I'm like, oh, well that works out So, how does the material work with the story? It's the best answer I have. Cool. Thank so. you. Talked a lot. I have one more question slash comment. Um, I don't know how subconscious versus conscious it was, but I really find the juxtaposition of the woodworking, which is very typically male and hard, for lack of a better word, versus the female figures that are more soft, and the male pieces are all functional pieces, like the table or the chairs, or like all of them serve a supporting role, I guess, in a way, um, which I think is kind of a nice, maybe, reversal of roles, right, because we think of women more as the supporters. Uh, and then also, especially with the window piece, thinking about... I mean, I studied art history, so this is kind of my thing, but especially in Dutch 17th century painting, for lack of a better comparison, like this idea of the exterior world that you look out onto being the male world versus the interior being the female world, um, and the curtain sort of being, or window, in either way, but we are very much in the interior of the space, given that the curtains are on our side. And so I just think it's a really interesting, like initially when I was looking at your work, I definitely like predominantly felt the feminine presence, but the more I look at it, there's there's elements of the masculine, which I think is really interesting and serves to kind of just further heighten the feminine aspect. Oh, I love that. Thank you. This is being recorded. I will be recording with them later. Um, no, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, wow. Uh, I mean, I have used, I've, in the past, I've used like a lot of bricks with the tired bodies because I'm, I was thinking more about like this physical weight and the force and uh, like, you know, all the psychological pressure and things that happen from all these things we're talking about and how that physically manifests. And so I used to often use bricks and cinder blocks and ropes and things. And I was interested in continuing this relationship between soft and not soft, right? 
but I had not considered how this relationship between masculine and feminine with that, and that is lovely and awesome, and I think really interesting because, like all of the things you said, but also that like, you guys are now going to watch the process, this is great. Uh, I have a great relationship with my partner, and I think it's very, like I often think it's like a great um, example of a fairly equal relationship where we both take care of our daughter, and we both work, and we both have non-traditional jobs, so we also have non-traditional schedules, which I think allows us to kind of embrace this much more equal role in the household and the not household. But despite that equality that I feel we have groomed over the years, I still often feel like I am pulling the weight. Um, just inherently, like there's just things that happen. I mean, I don't cook, so that's not, I'm not doing that. Only brand cooks. But, but like, I often still feel like the primary parent. You know, that like, if there's something goes wrong, like I'm the parent that gets asked. Now this has shifted a lot in the past year, especially, um, as I've traveled more and the brand also travels more. And so there's actually, almost because we're both traveling in different times, there's like this weird dynamic thing that's happening where the equality is becoming easier to manage because like we're both absent at different times. So anyways, my point being is like I'm interested in this role of masculine support because I do experience it and I'm interested in that. Like, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Alright, well thank you Jessica. <laughs> thank you everyone for being here so much. Thank you.